Hi, my name is Meredith Ebbs. I'll be presenting for you today on Introduction to Visual Coding. I'd like to thank Class Cover for inviting me to speak at this, at this online webinar. It's very exciting. I work for the University of Adelaide in the CESA program. We're a national program where we have project offices in each state. We have federal funding to run workshops for teachers to teach them how to use digital technologies. We now have a digital technology component from K to eight that is mandatory across all states. And the states that have not implemented Australian curriculum have the same requirement in their own jurisdiction under their own curriculum or syllabus. Today I'll be presenting um, by sharing my screen. I'll be showing you a presentation and I'll also be demonstrating how to code. To get the most out of today's workshop, you may like to have your own browser open so that you can follow along. Alternatively, you may like to watch back later on a phone or a tablet and use that opportunity to open a browser on your computer and follow the steps. That way you'll be able to pause the recording at any time so that you can have more time to investigate. So I'd just like to share my screen with you. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, wherever you happen to be. My nation is the Biripai Nation on the east coast of New South Wales. And I'd like to acknowledge, pay my respects to the elders past, present and future, and thank them for the culture and for the traditions that they bring to enrich our lives. This is a picture of the project offices in each state. We have three project offices working in New South Wales. We have myself, I'm just gonna move my mouse so you can see, that's me. I tend to do regional and Northern New South Wales. We have Helen, who is based in Sydney. And we have Tony, who's based in the ACT, but covers a lot of Southern New South Wales. If you are in another state, we have Lauren, Sue, Robin in Western Australia, Karen and Ben are in South Australia, and we have Peter in Tasmania and Celia in Victoria. If you're interested to know more about our program in your state, uh, I will share my, pro my presentation with Class Cover and there are contact details in that. The first thing I'd like to do is just look at the curriculum. We have an Australian curriculum now, and we've gone from being a consumer and a user of technology to a focus on being a creator and a developer with digital technologies. So it's very important that we start to teach computational thinking, design thinking, and systems thinking. Now today what I'm going to be looking at is the computational thinking component of the new curriculum. It's very important to be aware that there's a difference between digital technologies and an ICT capability. An ICT capability is your ability to use a computer or technology to perform a task. And this is a, competent, this is a competency that is required by every single person as we move forward into education and in our careers. ICT capabilities are covered in every single KLA from K to 12. And ICT capabilities are not, tend, they tend not to be assessed uh, because they are not outcomes or content descriptor driven. They're actually just skills that are required to perform a task. For example, using mail, creating a document, creating a spreadsheet, creating a presentation and then sharing with a wider community, or using an app or an iPad. Those types of skills should be covered in every single key learning area across our curriculum. Every single teacher is responsible for that, just like every single teacher is responsible for literacy and numeracy, while we may have specialists in English and maths. Digital technologies is when we learn to use those skills to create and develop new content. It's understanding how the technology works and why it works that way. It's also used to create solutions. A child or an adult without an ICT capability will struggle to use some forms of technology 
because they have not got the skills to actually open the computer, log on, and actually plug in the devices that they want to use. The new curriculum has a focus on computational thinking. So computational thinking has four parts to it. The first is breaking down a larger problem. That's called decomposition. Taking down the problem into smaller parts so that we can manage those parts. Then we go into pattern recognition. Each part of that problem may have patterns. So we need to be able to identify the patterns and work out if we can create a sequence of steps that are going to be simple or how complex those patterns are will influence the procedures and steps that we need. The algorithm design is the actual flow of those patterns. It's the step-by-step -step sequence. The step-by-step -step sequence is what we use to create our coded um, programs. The fourth quadrant in that diagram is abstraction. Abstraction is when we remove extra information that we don't need. And an example of this would be when you have a maths problem and it's a worded problem that has way more information than is required to just solve the steps. And I'll give you an example about that in a moment. We're going to be using a tool called pencilcode.net, which I have printed here down the bottom of the writing. And we're going to be looking at that at how to reproduce the steps to draw a square. But first, we need to find out what is an algorithm. So we're just going to watch this video from code.org. The reason I'm using this video is to show you that you don't actually have to have all the knowledge. There is a lot of pre-made resources out there and code.org is a really great place to start to find a sequence of lessons that you could implement in your classroom. is called real life algorithms. Algorithms describe things that people do every day. Cookie recipes and directions for building a birdhouse are all everyday algorithms. Today we are going to make and create and test an algorithm for a paper airplane. But first we need to break this big project into easy to follow small steps. For making a paper airplane we need to decide what steps to take and in what order to take them. You'll create your algorithm by first cutting apart the pictures. Next, you will select the six pictures that show the steps needed to make a paper airplane and arrange those pictures in the correct order. After you have everything in order, you will trade algorithms with another student team to test out the algorithm to see if the algorithm works. A well-designed algorithm is super important to making the best paper airplane. When we want to make chocolate, there are many big steps to that process, and each of those big steps has its own set of smaller steps. And there are different recipes or algorithms depending on how we want the chocolate to taste. Each step is important, even the small ones. So without one step, the rest of them cannot be completed. Creating algorithms that others can understand is really important. That's why each step has to be written down, so no matter who does it, the result is the same. So what is programming? Programming is also called coding. And code is a set of instructions for an algorithm for the computer to implement. So we write code to tell the computer what to do. So in a stage one or a K to two, F to two classroom, you're looking at these pictures at the top of the screen here on the left on the white section of the slide. This is an example of code, block coding that a a five to eight year old may use in their classroom. When you're into junior primary, years three to six, you would be considering this type of programming. This is a little still block coding, but a little bit more complex. It starts to include words, but the blocks still click together to form a sequence of steps. Now, if we have a look at this program, part of the skills of teaching coding is getting students to understand what the steps mean. So if we read through these blocks, it says, when the green flag is clicked, forever, repeat, move 15 steps, 
turn 10 degrees. Think hmm, for two seconds and that will display a small speech bubble above the head of the sprite or the character. Play a pop sound until done and set the size to 100%. And it will repeat that process over and over. In a year seven or eight classroom, we then move on to simple text-based coding. There's no specification as to which language should be used for that. But this code here is to draw a star. So you go forward and then you're going to turn two times 360 and you're going to divide it by N, N being the number of sides. So down here, the pen is turquoise with a thickness of 10 and we're entering star seven. Seven will go back up into the N to, to determine what type of star we draw. Then down here, we have a far more complex text-based coding, which is looking at numbers and drawing as well. For a primary classroom, you are, look, you are considering this model here, which is done using an app called Scratch Junior, and you're looking at this here, which is done using Scratch. This is a picture of the Scratch screen. You can see down the left-hand side, there is um, menus, then there are some buttons. This is where we compose the text. And over here is the stage. That will be where I see the action that my characters are doing. The characters in Scratch are called sprites. You can see down here, I have two sprites. I have Nemo and the yellow fish. This one here is called Scratchy. Scratchy is the cat and Scratch is the default sprite that will appear on your screen when you open up your Scratch program. This is an interface for Scratch Junior. Scratch Junior is an app. It is a free download and it only operates on iPads. So this is the interface and um, I've got this image from the Scratch Junior website, which has got lots more information on how to use Scratch. Um, and you can see there is a stage that once again, there are sprites, there's menu bars, and these are all the buttons that I can use to compose my code. So when I click on the green flag, move forward one step, jump up four times, jump up two times. If I touch the cat, and I can tell it's the cat because it's the one that's selected, then turn right, turn left, and repeat that four times. There are two different codes happening on that program. One is when I touch the cat with my finger, and one is when I click on or tap, when I tap the green flag. Here is a picture of the Scratch website, just a little larger. That's what it will look like when you open it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open Scratch and show you how to build a simple program. So when I'm open, you can log in. If you sign in, you need to be over 13 to use Scratch. There are teacher accounts that you can get if you'd like to use this with your students. As a casual teacher, I would recommend you build your teacher account and have several accounts already made that you can distribute to students in the class for the day. Uh, that way you, they aren't uh, using those accounts with, without your supervision. I click up here on create. It will create my new screen. If you haven't used it before, you need to close the screen down. That is called a wizard. That will take you through a short tutorial on how to use um, the different features of Scratch. Now, here is Scratchy the cat. I was telling you about it before. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set an event. I'm going to drag over when the flag is clicked. This is the flag here. I would like to move Scratchy the cat 10 steps. And then I would like to play a sound. So when I click the flag, you can see Scratchy didn't really move very far. So if you'd like to modify the steps, you can make it 100. 
Now, what I'd like to do is add another event. When space key is pressed, I'd like to do that. But you can see that Scratchy the cat is moving off the screen. There is a Cartesian playing here. And at the moment, Scratchy the cat is on 210. But if I move it back to where it started, I can get a different Cartesian plane reference. You can see that if I move Scratch to the cat, this XY reference changes. So Scratch could be used to teach maths and Cartesian planes if you wanted to. What I want to do is every time I press space, I'm going to take away the sound because it's a bit uh, noisy. I'm going to replace the sound with hello. Now, if I want the cat, every time I press space, the cat keeps wandering off the screen. So I want the cat to be able to come back. So when I click the flag, I want the cat to glide back to minus 117, minus 40. So if I press space, I have to wait until the hello disappears because hello is going for two seconds. Then when I click on the flag, it brings the cat back to reset. That flag is now acting like a reset button when you play a game on your phone or on a gaming device. When I press restart, it resets the stage back to start again. So that's Scratch. Scratch is uh, free to use. It's very accessible in most schools. A lot of schools are using it. Some departments refuse to allow use of this program because um, of data storage and age. So you'll need to check with your local schools whether this is a program that is allowed to be used. Now I'm going to look at the design of algorithms. Using that computational thinking model, let's think about drawing a square. So first of all, we need to consider when we're drawing our square, what features of that square do we need to consider? Bearing in mind that algorithms don't need to have technology to be taught. You can teach to algorithms offline without any technology. So that's what we're looking at now. So the feature of, of, features of a square include size, length of sides, the color, orientation, the outside line, what's the thickness or the color? What are the properties of a square? Four equal sides and a 90 degree angle. Now there's a lot of information there about squares. What we need to think when we're going to program a square is what information do we need and what information isn't required. So thinking about that, the only information we actually need to draw a square are the length of the side and four corners that are the same angle. So the abstraction process which if you recall was one of the four steps where we remove extra information. Can, we can remove color, orientation and the outside line. We only need to know the length of the sides, that they have four equal sides and four 90 degree angles. You can see that you don't need to be on a computer to have to break it down into steps. Uh, that and that um, YouTube of Sheldon Cooper and the Big Bang Theory actually demonstrates how you could make a flowchart and use that flowchart to talk and discuss about the steps in a procedure. And it also illustrates decisions and you can see the diamond shape is every time there's a diamond shape that is when there is a decision that needs to be made in that um, flowchart. So I've done a decision chart on planning a square. So we're going to draw a square, we're going to turn 90 degrees, we're going to turn left, we're going to go forward 100 pixels, which is um, how we measure dots on a computer screen. And then we're going to repeat that three more times. Turn right 90 degrees or turn left 90 degrees. 
So once you've turned, if you turn right, you would go the other way. Same procedure, but there was a decision there. Were you turning left or right? Once we've drawn the square, we need to consider the detail then. What's the colour of the line, the thickness of the line, the fill of colour, the orientation and the number of squares. Here is an example of what that code might look like, both for a primary school student and for a secondary student in year seven and eight. So I'm going to demonstrate how to make that code. And I'm going to go to a website called pencilcode.net. If you were to go into the draw, jam or imagine options, there's lots of workshops in there to work through how to solve various problems. We're actually going to go into let's play. Now remember, we're drawing a square. So um, when you open this program for the first time with students, the first thing they're going to do is click on that triangle. Don't be afraid to give students a little bit of time to play because it may actually reduce the amount of instructions you need to give later on because they will have already had some time to familiarize themselves with how this works. So you can see when I press the play button, the turtle, is moving around, it's actually following the steps in these blocks. This pen is red. It's going a speed of two. Now for 25 times, it's going to go forward, turn right 88 degrees. Forward 88 degrees. And it's doing that steps 25 times. Now what we want to do is draw a square. So I'm going to drag off that yellow block and then drop it back on the menu. We're going to go forward 100, turn right 90 degrees. Now if I press play, excellent. Forward, turn right 90 degrees. Now uh, here's three and four students or students that have never done this before may just drag block out after block. And that's perfectly fine and it's correct. So once you've done that, you could then challenge students to say, can you do the same shape with less blocks? And to use uh, a loop, which I've mentioned a few times now, a loop is a repeat. I can actually go onto the control menu and drag out the control for a loop. Now at the moment, I only need Um, two blue blocks, so I'm going to drag out the runs I don't need. I'm going to press play. Now when I press play, you can see it's going four blocks exactly. The reason it's going four blocks exactly is because each square on that grid has a 25 by 25 um, edge. So the grid is a 25 by 25 pixels to keep the grid even. That makes it very easy to measure distance. Now the other thing you may have noticed is it stopped drawing after three times. I would pose that to the students. Why did it stop drawing after three times? And the reason is because there's a three in the loop. If I change the loop to a four, and if I increase the speed just a little, you can see the turtle will do much faster and it drew four sides. Now, I have jumped from working out the properties of the square straight to pencil code to build. You could make this an easier process by asking students to draw their own instructions to draw a square. Now, once you have done this, uh, you want students in a use five and six to modify code. So to modify code, they could do several things. You could ask them to add another square. You could ask them to change the color of the pen. Or you may ask them to change the length of the sides on the square. So if I was to change the color of the pen, I can just click that uh, arrow and choose orange. Hopefully that's clear enough. I could, I'll choose purple, it's a bit darker. I may also like to change the length of the sides. So I'm going to change that to 200. 
you can see it changes. You may ask them to turn left 90 degrees rather than right. So modifying code doesn't have to be very difficult initially. Uh, you may like to ask them to draw a second square, in which case I would need to repeat those steps and I'm going to change the colour of the pen. That extra box there is the thickness of the line. So I'm leaving it one so that it'll be the same as the one I, the box I've already drawn. I'm going to put in, make it four sides. Left 90. Okay. Let's see what that does. Okay, I'm going to change the colour of the box so it makes it easier. Okay. So there's one way of modifying a square. If, I'll just go back to the presentation. Then we have our simple algorithm. Then I've asked them to modify the square. This one here has got a fill block. If I go back into here, I can go to art. So the blocks are color coded. They're color coded according to the menu that you're on. So if it's purple, it's on the purple art menu. When I fill that in, press play you can see that it will just simply fill the last thing it drew. Now the text-based coding for secondary teachers, you need to click the small picture here and that will take you into the text-based coding. The code is called CopyScript and this type of tool would be a really great tool to introduce the seven and eight students to because it starts with blocks and moves into text. Um, year six, may at the end of the year, once students start to become more confident, may introduce a little bit of text-based coding to prepare them for high school and what they're going to see. Um, if you've got some exceptionally gifted or advanced students who are really enjoying their coding, you may also introduce that. But don't feel pressured to introduce text-based coding at a primary level because it's really important at the primary level that they understand the concepts that they understand what all the blocks are for and they understand how the code works. That is the priority. They need to be able to plan, they need to be able to construct, and they need to be able to modify. They um, may, you may give them code that doesn't work, for instance. If you think back to the very first pattern that came up on the screen when we first opened this program, I don't know if you recall, but it had 88 as the angle and you can see that's not drawing a square you could give this to students and say could you please fix that i want it to be two squares and the students need to read through the code and decode what it's doing and where the mistake is which would be the 88 if i change it back to 90 it will draw my squares so it's really important that you focus on what the skill is that students are required to learn and what the verbs are so that you can then teach to that content and that assess achievement standard rather than over teaching and running out of time. I'm just going to go back to the presentation. So I've got my square, I've got it drawn. How do I get it to, you might pose a problem of how do I get the square to start on a different angle? And if you have a look here, this looks like it's on a 45 degree tilt. So if I go back in here and I actually put, I'm just gonna delete that last option. If I put in one little angle before my loop, and I'm going to slow it down so you can see what happened. 
So you can see there that the turtle, before drawing my square, tilted right 45 degrees, then drew the square. Now I would like it to have a thicker line. So if I drag in my purple block with 10, what does that do? And I would like it to be coloured in yellow. So I go to fill and instead of blue, I choose yellow. And that's how you can modify your code. Um, now what we've also got here is we've got some resources. Now these resources would be useful for teaching yourself how to code. We have the Australian Computing Academy where they unpack the curriculum and they have free resources for use with you and your students. If you don't have any students but you have an education email, you can sign up and access this resource plus a whole stack more for free. You've got your Australian Curriculum Standards, you've got your Sequence of Achievements and your Sequence of Content. If you are not in a, a state that uses Australian Curriculum, you need to contact your local education authority. Usually they have a website where they have your local version of the Australian Curriculum. You need to look closely and read the content associated with digital technologies to find out what you're required to do in your state. This is a link that will take you to the resources that I've mentioned in the webinar. So you will be able to access this from class cover and you will get, you can download a copy to all of the resources that I've mentioned. If you watch this to the completion of the webinar, I would greatly appreciate if you could type this URL into your um, website, into your browser. And I would greatly appreciate if you could complete that evaluation. My name is Meredith Ebbs and I work for the University of Adelaide and complete your evaluation on what you thought of this webinar. Now, one last thing before I go is how do you learn more? So we have five online courses that are all free and are all mapped to the 8SL standards. So that means you can claim 21 hours for the foundations course to learn how to code and teach digital technologies. In New South Wales, that would be teacher identified hours, not provider endorsed hours. So to get to our online course, I have actually put a link to our online course in this presentation. The URL, just in case you don't access the presentation, is cserMOOCs.adelaide.edu.au. And when you get to the website, you click on Available MOOCs. A MOOC is a massive open online course, and they are frequently free. So you can see down the bottom here, we have all of our courses. The foundations course has no assumed knowledge and is perfectly suitable for any teacher from K to 12. Um, you, you click on the foundations course and you go through into the course registration page. You can use your education Gmail or your personal Gmail. Please don't sign up with a Hotmail or a Yahoo or a Big Pond or any other accounts. Please ensure that you have a Gmail account. And I've put in um, the notes how to access a Gmail account if you don't have an education one. Once you've registered, it will take you through a whole stack of online content. Um, it's very easy to do. It's a little bit of a paragraph of writing, then it has a YouTube video about four minutes long, then it has some more writing next in the same format through the whole eight modules. Um, I highly recommend it. It will definitely teach you the content associated with the new digital technologies content and it's relevant to whatever state you're in. It is mapped to Australian curriculum, but it, each state has adopted its own version of Australian curriculum. So you are required to teach digital technologies from K to eight and this course 
is the one to get you started on that. I, I, if you have any questions about how to teach digital technologies, how to access the course, we can, um, you can contact us. So you can contact us by going to our website, which was cserMOOCs.adelaide.edu.au. We have got a professional learning page. And when you click on professional learning, you can scroll down the bottom to the blue button and request uh, some contact from a project officer and they can update you with any courses we're running in your state. Uh, we also do webinars and we also have a free lending library. So if you're working in a school and you've completed our online course or a workshop with us, you can actually go to our lending library and request a free kit for a term. Um, please bear in mind that our federal funding grant ends in June next year. So if we, if we are unable to secure more funding, the face-to-face -face service will end. However, our online courses will stay posted on the university website. I'm really, really thankful that Class Cover invited me today. And if you would like to keep in touch or follow, connect with me on social media, you can contact me there with those links. Um, and I wish you all the best for learning how to teach with digital technologies in your classroom. Thank you very much.